Welcome to The Real Freedom Show, where we inspire you to pursue your passion to gain time and financial freedom through opportunities in real estate. I'm your host, Mike Swenson. Let's get some real freedom together. All right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Real Freedom, where we talk about building time and financial freedom through opportunities in real estate. I'm your host, Mike Swenson, and we love sharing about different ways that people are pursuing their passions. Everybody comes from different backgrounds. Everybody has different gifts and building streams of income outside of real estate, which we'll also talk about with today's guest, Brandon Thomas. Brandon grew up and has a background in West Virginia. You served as a property manager through college, got into working with investors and you're a licensed realtor. You have a team and then you also work on flips and buy and holds, West Virginia, Maryland, a couple other states as well. You're Claim to fame, I guess, if you want to call it that. Building a 15-unit portfolio is 600 bucks. So obviously, we're going to talk about that, creative financing, and then giving back through your clothing company that you have. And so there's a lot of fun stuff, a lot of cool things that you've got going on, Brandon. So we are so excited to have you on the show. Thanks, Mike. I'm so happy to be here. I'm excited to talk about all the fun stuff that we have in store today. Share a little bit about your background and what led you up to getting into real estate and kind of where you're at today. Yeah, so uh, to touch point in what you already said, in college, I was a property manager for a 65-unit apartment building, and the owner of the building would always, you know, check in weekly, but what kind of really got me into wanting to be an investor is seeing how much money was coming in each month that that this person was just pocketing each month because the, the whole thing was paid off. And uh, once I saw those numbers, I was like, I got to get into this. I got to figure this out. And that was definitely the tipping point. And it's, I, I haven't looked back. So what, uh, in terms of kind of property management, then how did you get that job? What was your your background or how did you get connected to get into property management? Yeah. So I have a bachelor's and master's in accounting. I went to WVU and I had an internship to be a like staff accountant or something for this property management company. But it ended up being a full fledged like property management role. So I, I dealt with leases, you know, rent collection, you know, book doing the books essentially for the for the apartment complex as well, uh, managing repairs with the, the the repairmen, and that's how I that's how I really got into that role specifically. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting that you said that 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 was your exposure in college. Um, I had somebody that I knew that own some rental properties. And what I heard from them was now these are single family homes and he only had a handful, but he's kind of like, well, why, why do I want to invest in real estate when I'm just making, you know, hundred bucks, 200 bucks a unit? Like that doesn't seem very lucrative. And he had another business on the side, but there's so much more than just that little bit of cash flow. There's all these other benefits that he didn't see, but somebody like you that saw it at a high level and could see somebody with quite a few units is like, wait a second, there's a lot of opportunity there. And I think that's what people miss about real estate because you hear people talk about find a property that cash flows and they're thinking, well, wait a second, I got to pour 25, 25% down. Now you can talk about creative financing, but kind of the traditional thinking is 25% down. I'm putting all that money in to not really make cash flow or maybe make a cash flow. Like, yeah, what is what's in it for me? But you got to see that firsthand and having your, you know, accounting finance background to be able to see that. Obviously, your eyes were open in a different way, and you were fortunate to see that to want to jump into that. Yeah. And that was just, you know, the cash flow piece. It doesn't even take into account the appreciation, you know, the, you know, year to year, you see about 4% appreciation on average, you know, no matter what the, uh, what region you're in, that's about the average. And once you stack that, you know, over five years, you know, that's, that's 20% of your appreciation. That could be your cash that you already put down, you know, back in appreciation over that time period. And uh, the tax benefits as well, you know, being a, an accountant, you know, per se, uh, the the depreciation and saving money in your taxes every year is also just a huge benefit that people just don't realize. Well, and going back to appreciation, you're not, I mean, for some people that do pay cash on the property, um, you're getting that 
4% or 5% return on your entire investment. But if you're putting down, let's say 20%, 25%, you're actually getting a 4X or a 5X return on your appreciation. Because I always use the example of, you know, the lender's not going to come to you and be like, well, I own 75% of the property. So I want 75% of that appreciation. It's not like that. You get 100% of the appreciation by only owning a certain percentage of the property. And so that really is the big piece that people miss out when they see, Oh, appreciation at 4% or 5%, they think, well, I can go put my money somewhere else and earn more than that. Well, no, because you're you're only getting a certain percent. I can't go borrow money. I can't go to a, you know, if I am investing in Apple, I can't say, well, I want to put down 20% on Apple stock. Um, if you finance the other 80%, I want all the returns. And so that's the sneaky benefit that people just don't realize. Yeah, you you nailed it. So you saw that firsthand. Talk about those next steps then getting into it yourself. Yeah. So, you know, I don't come from a a wealthy family, you know, we never grew up with a lot of money. So in order for me to get involved, I really had to get creative with it. And so I started out, I got my real estate license and I started learning all the real estate jargon, knowing the forms, um, knowing, you know, the different types of addendums, the different types of loans that were out there, you know, what kind of loans can I go out there and invest in real estate with no money out of pocket? You know, there's, there are a few out there. Um, but they weren't really appealing to me. And so luckily with the power of networking, I was able to, uh, it, this is actually a really funny story. I, I did a Facebook post and I was like, Hey, you know, I'm thinking about getting into real estate investing. This is, you know, something that I've been working on for a few years now. I'm really passionate about it. I'm looking for like-minded people who'd be interested in, you know, partnering up and a, a gentleman that I graduated high school with, sent me a, a DM. He's like, Hey man, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about getting into this too. And he's, he's already got successful businesses uh, in Morgantown. And I was like, well, this is going to be a, per- a perfect partnership with like him having already the business mindset and stability and me bringing the real estate knowledge over to this, this partnership. It just, it all clicked. And uh, we got our, we got our first five unit in Morgantown that we, we bought creatively. Um, well, you know what? I guess it wasn't exactly creative, but it was kind of creative more on our partnership because he put down the 20% uh, for the down payment and he gets a larger portion of our cash flow each month that I'm paying back from my half of his down payment that he essentially financed for me um, mm-hmm. over, I can't remember what it is, like over 10 years or something like that. Um, but we're, we're <laughs> I'm going to have to throw a little bit more money into another project we have and it'll offset the loan a little bit that we have. Um, but that was one of our creative ways. And then we also bought a, a 10 unit. Let's see about six months later, that was very creative. So after all of this happened we, a 10 unit came on the market and both these properties were on, on market as well. These weren't off market. So all, both of them had multiple offers and what was so cool about our 10 unit um, offer was it wasn't over asking price. The other offers we know definitely were over asking price when there's multiple offers, someone's going to go over asking. But what we did is we reached out to the agent and we were like, would the owners be interested in holding the down payment, the 20% down payment as a second lien over a certain amount of time with interest? And they came back and they were like, yeah, you know what? They would be interested in doing that. So we put together an offer. We got 80% commercial loan from the bank. And then we submitted with the offer that the current sellers would be holding 20% at, I think it was 4% over 15 years. And we also included the amortization schedule, how much potential interest they would be making over that time period. And um, what the monthly payment would be, how we would be paying it, like just direct deposit each month. And uh, once they saw all these numbers, they were like, yes, this is this is what we want to do. And I mean, essentially, we're putting you know one of their kids through college just with the interest alone that they're making on this loan. So the um, the six hundred dollars that came out of pocket was just for closing costs between me and two other partners to split on the yeah. deal. Well, and that's the beauty. I mean, so many people don't realize what's out there. And for somebody like me that is an agent when I talk to investors that aren't agents, they they think so much bigger because as an agent, we tend to think how the typical residential transaction flows. 
and investors are much more creative in their thinking. And so I've had to learn to think outside the box and come up with different options. But like you said, you're providing a solution where, you know, the sticker price isn't the same, but what they actually get is much larger because they're becoming the bank. And if you can help show them, it's going to take a little bit of extra work and some extra conversations. But if you can show them, hey, you can make more money here outside of just what purchase price is. It doesn't mean everybody's going to go for that, but for the right people, it's it's a big win for them. And like you said, it helps put people through college because they're being the bank. Like instead of the bank building all these other buildings and having these nice offices, why don't you let the current owner have some extra money and they're going to be super excited about it? Yeah. And I mean, we love also like throwing offers for like owner finance properties and stuff like that, but whenever for them to do an owner, an owner finance situation, usually they want some sort of down payment. So this is the kind of the reverse side of it because they're still getting 80% at closing from a loan from the bank and then they're financing the remaining. So it's still zero out of pocket for us. Uh, but mm -hmm. this is, it's like a reverse owner finance because there's getting a down payment from the bank is how I see it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And, and so it sounds like everything's going well with that property and, and they're pumped about it still. So, I mean, we've had our, uh, our hiccups, um, we had to replace some panels and that has really set us back. But luckily we've been working with the insurance company and they allowed us to do two or three panels a month. Cause I mean, it's a 10 unit, but there's like 20 different panels between all the different rooms, garages, stuff like that that needed upgraded. Mm -hmm. uh, but the insurance company worked with us and allowed us to do two or three panels a month. And we're able to pay for those panels through the cash flow. So mm -hmm. nothing has been directly out of our pocket, but we're still, yeah. you know, not making any money off of it, but at least everything's getting updated, fixed through the cash flow. And uh, for us, that was a, a huge win. Well, I, it was interesting. I had a conversation earlier today with somebody and we were talking about buying smaller multifamily versus something a little bit larger. Talk about, you know, as, as you're analyzing maybe like a one or a two unit deal versus this 10 unit deal, what do you see as the benefits of going to kind of the small or the little bit larger multifamily versus something maybe one or two units with kind of, I'm, I'm leading up to the answer of you can have a little bit more meat on the bone to these to do these types of things, but I'm curious to hear your perspective on it yeah i mean i think it it comes down to your risk tolerance you know if if you want more of the appreciation side of things then i would say go more of the single family route because they do appreciate a little bit quicker from in, in my uh, understanding uh, but if you want something that's like going to be guaranteed cash flow uh, especially the larger ones where you get a, a commercial loan you know these are variable rates that change every five years you know luckily our rates are you know around three four percent on these ones but if we were to buy them at the rates now, I don't, I mean, we might be breaking even on these, um, but that would be probably the, the larger thing is just, it just comes down to your personal risk tolerance. Do you want to at least have your mortgage paid? Then I'd say go larger, you know, in a worst case scenario, if you're looking for more appreciation and if you get one crappy tenant in there, that's going to keep missing your monthly, uh, their monthly rent. And you got to come out of pocket for that for that mortgage like that that could be a killer um so yeah it, it really just comes down to to that in, in my opinion yeah and i think what some people might see as uh less units being less of a risk it is that opposite because yeah out of 10 tenants if one tenant or one one unit is vacant or somebody didn't pay this month you still have nine rent checks coming in if I've got a duplex and one person doesn't pay, I've lost 50% of my income. And so it is a little counterintuitive where the larger properties, you can spread that risk out more um, versus a smaller property that just doesn't happen. Yeah. And I mean, I'll give you an example here for the 10 unit. We had at one point five or six, I can't remember, five or six um, vacant units at one time. And we were still able to pay the mortgage, pay the insurance, pay utilities and all that off those four units. So if that tells you anything right there, you know, that wouldn't be able to happen in a, in a single family or probably not even a duplex, you know, with today's interest rates anyways. In terms of the vacancy, was that because you were updating units? Is that because seasonality type thing? Or was that in the transition of when you got the, the property? Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, it was it was in the transition of when we bought it. 
there were, I think, three vacant vacancies when we bought it. And then shortly after, I'd say it wasn't even a month after, we had some tenants who <laughs> apparently were not from this country. I'll put it lightly. <laughs> and mm -hmm. they all of a sudden sent me a text message and was like, hey, we got to leave. Sorry. Essentially, I mean, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And it was a large family and they were taking up two units. And we just own, I mean, we only own the place for maybe two or three weeks at this point and mm -hmm. they just bolted. And so that put us in a tight spot and we had a lot of vacancies, but I'd say it only took maybe maybe a month to get it back to full capacity. We still have one that's vacant and that's just because we're choosing to not rent it out because we, we need to do a few things to it. But right now we're at full capacity at all, all our units. And I think having other, other conversations with investors, I've, I, I kind of set that expectation with them is, look, if you're looking for a non-risk opportunity that has a ton of cash flow and everybody's in the units paying on time and it's perfect, like those deals just aren't there right now. And so there's some challenge, some hiccups that you're going to have to overcome. And so it might be the rents are low. It might be the units need to be up, updated. It might be the management was poorly ran previously. And now you're bringing in a higher level of management. And even with that, because you're bringing a high level, level of management, tenants might leave because they don't want to be held accountable in ways because maybe the the old landlord looked a different way, you know, when they weren't paying or when they had issues or they didn't respond to them. So there's going to be some sort of problem solving that you're going to have to do uh, to be able to turn those units. Um, but therein lies the opportunity. You've got to take something that has, you know, some, some wheels that need to be greased a little bit and make it better. And that's your opportunity to make money is to improve the condition or improve the tenants or improve the processes of those properties. Yeah, you nailed it. I mean, you don't make money unless you're solving a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, if the problem's already been solved, then you're not making any money. Exactly. Yeah, because everybody's looking for those units and those units aren't out there. Yep, exactly. So talk about finding properties because you mentioned you're looking in, in some other states as well. What are you looking for when you're looking for deals? Yeah, so my my brother-in-law, he's in, he's in upstate New York near the, uh, the Finger Lakes and um, like the Ithaca region uh and we're, we're trying to find like an airbnb probably up there and then uh my flipping partner here in maryland he wants something in the carolinas so so we're also looking for an airbnb in the carolinas and uh, i got family who wants to to get a, a condo or something in ocean city and i'm everywhere man you know if if it if it makes sense financially and the numbers make sense and like i said it comes back down to my risk tolerance if it makes sense i mean i'll, I'll invest just about anywhere um so yeah that's those are probably all the primary locations that we're looking at and what's the what's the logic here there what are you curious in terms of kind of short term rentals when you have apartment complexes is it diversification or is it cash flow or is it kind of everywhere in between it's it's everywhere in between, but it certainly uh, plays a big part with just diversification. You know, I I've never really dabbled in the the short term rental, you know, um, area. You know, I've ran mm -hmm. the numbers. I've we've been under contract before in a cabin uh, near like Deep Creek Lake, Maryland, and it didn't really work out. We came to a disagreement a couple times and. And then we we were also under contract on a, an old post office that we were going to Airbnb in the same area. And again, it came into just disagreements with uh, inspections and it just, it never worked out. So I, I'd like to get into that space just to, just to learn from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of people that I've talked to, um, you hear these stories and, and maybe they're not going to be as exciting of numbers as the wild west back in the day, but at the same time, short-term rentals, do provide great cash flow. That doesn't mean that you don't have to work hard for it. That doesn't mean you don't have to investigate the market, run numbers, um, pick the right properties in the right locations with the right amenities. But it's also totally a different mindset. You're thinking about hospitality. You're providing an experience versus you're providing housing. Yes, you're providing housing, but you're being judged on the experience as well. And so it's a different mentality approaching those properties. But when done well, you you can make a lot of money that way. Yeah, exactly. I mean, 
it definitely comes down to, you know, they're leaving you reviews and other people are going to see these reviews. It's not like that in the long-term rental space. You know, I don't have an old tenant saying this guy didn't come at 3 a.m. and, you know, unclog my toilet. <laughs> you're not, you're not going to see that in the long-term rental uh, space. So yeah, you know, it's just building that brand and uh, reputation. And if we can do it in one state, then I don't see why we can't do it in another. Well, that's exciting. So talk a little bit about, you know, we, we want to focus on time and financial freedom through real estate. So you've got a clothing company that you've launched now. How did that come to be? So it's it's, it's really just a passion project. You know, I've, I've always been, I don't know, fashion minded. You know, I, I care what I look like when I go out in public, but I don't care that much. Mm-hmm. But there's no really ideal uh, clothing brand out there for real estate investors, for entrepreneurs, you know, for people who want to have this this kind of freedom. And so I kind of took that twist and, and I, I wake up at like three o'clock in the morning and I always have my best ideas from like three to six a.m. And this mm-hmm. is one of those ideas from three to six a.m. I just I got this idea. I created a logo. I went through this whole entire thing. I built the whole system, whole the whole process. And it was just a, just a passion project, man, is, um, but, and, you know, to, to get back on, on topic, there's, there's nothing out there for entrepreneurs and real estate investors. So I wanted to take something that could appeal to them, you know, could be a conversation piece. If they wear that out in top, out in public, they're going to be like, Oh, you know, your t-shirt says cash flow. Tell me more about that. You know? So it's just something like that. And I got a, I got a hoodie that says like leverage right here. And, mm-hmm. um, what else do I have? I mean, we, we only launched two weeks ago, so we're we're still in the the soft launch phase. But yeah, man, we got our fall lineup out and and uh it's been a good two weeks so far for the business. I'm hoping to get the expand the website a little bit and I'd love to be on Amazon by twenty twenty four. Yeah. And you mentioned that it it pretty much runs itself, right? And so people can have these ideas and create something where it's not, hey, order comes in. I'm printing the t-shirt and now I'm shipping it and sending it out. Um, you can do that automated. And so talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So the, I think the best part about that is that the entire system is essentially free. There's zero overhead in the, in the system I built. The website that I have connected is free. The drop shipper that I have is free. You know, the people who are paying for the products essentially the, the, the price gets pushed to the drop shipper. They get, you know, paid. And then all I get is the, the difference of the profit from the prices that I set on my website to what the actual cost is on the drop shipper website. So whenever they place the order on my website, it goes, which is a free website, goes straight to the drop shipper. They get the order. They do everything, ship it. You know, they handle the returns, um, cancellations, everything. They handle it gets shipped directly to them, to the person that bought the, you know, the item. And uh, then I just get paid the difference. Yeah. And so if nobody makes any purchases, you don't have hard costs. I have no, I'm not losing any money. Awesome. Well, yeah, that's, that's really cool. And, and you have the ability to do that because you kind of, you're your own boss, you get to decide what to do. And so you go take a little bit of time, get that set up. And now that runs itself. And now you can go focus on another stream of income. Yep. And I mean, I got the, I got the blueprint, you know, if I wanted to start a different type of clothing business or maybe sell accessories or cups or anything like that, I got the blueprint to do it and it's all going to be seamless. Awesome. And, and also too, I noticed that you're donating a portion of the profits of that too. Talk about that. Yeah. So I'm actually not taking any money from from the uh, the clothing company, uh, half half the net profits are going to uh, save the children foundation, and then the other half of the profits are just going to expanding the company with like overhead costs. You know, getting a better website that's not free. You know, mm-hmm. and just to have your products on Amazon, there's a monthly cost, and so that's what all the money is going to be going towards. I'm not taking a dime on this, man. Like I said, it's it's a passion project for me, and uh, I know that that foundation could use the funds a lot more than what I could. Real estate agents, are you tired of letting the busyness of your real estate business get in the way of your real estate investing goals and your financial future? I'm excited to announce that we've created the Real Freedom Investor Agent Tribe to help you. We've got a ton of content, educational tools to help accelerate your learning curve and get you on the right path 
to hit your investing goals. We also have a mastermind tribe of people just like you, agents that want to grow their own portfolio and encourage you and cheer you on along the way, as well as some private one-on-one -on -one coaching. So go to realfreedom.com, click on the store, you'll see the options there. We're so excited to be able to help you. I've priced it super low, so price can't get in the way, but did want to have some skin in the game for you um, to help with that accountability. So go check it out, realfreedom.com, click on the store. We're excited to connect with you and excited for you to connect with your tribe of real estate agents, investing, trying to build their financial freedom. And I know you, you mentioned too, you've got a real estate team um, that you do as well. We didn't cover anything on that, but anything more you want to talk about there? You know, I mean, it's a, it's a typical real estate team. Me and my, my, uh, my old broker, we started this team in Maryland and we have about four or five agents below us. And it's really just referral based for me. You know, if, if it's a good listing, I'll take it. Um, if it's a, a close friend, I'll help them buy. But a lot of it, I'm just outsourcing to to the other agents and letting them handle it. And again, going back to the financial freedom, you know, just just having a real estate license, you can get a referral fee just for referring someone. And mm -hmm. uh, there's really no work for for me to do, you know, once once you hand them off. Uh, but that's that's pretty much the team in a nutshell. That's awesome, and it, I mean, I mean, it, it it does speak to you've got different irons in the fire doing different things. You've got your rental properties, you've got some real estate sales, you've got your clothing company, um, you've got new ventures that you're pursuing in the short-term rentals. And so you're building all these different things that are working hand-to-hand -hand and to build the life that you want to live. Yeah, man. Uh, I, we didn't even touch on this. I actually have another company too. I have a, a financial services firm. So we do uh, like we set up trusts, we can set up whole life insurance policies, we can do IULs, you know, and all that ties into real estate investing and, you know, becoming the bank and the infinite banking policy. Uh, but that's a topic for another day, man. We might need to might have to do a part two on, on this. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brandon, for coming on and sharing. How can folks uh, reach out to you or get a hold of you if they want to learn more about what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, my Instagram is uh, Brandon Thomas Official. My TikTok is Brandon Thomas Official. My YouTube is Brandon Thomas Official. <laughs> my threads is Brandon Thomas Official. <laughs> I try and just claim it all, man. So I'd say the best way is just to DM me on Instagram, though. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Brandon, and sharing your story. Excited to see what you've accomplished and, and excited to see where you continue to grow in the future. So best of luck. Yeah, man, you too with the cast. Awesome. Thank you.